Well, Tamir, welcome to this podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to interview you. Uh, you have so many great ideas on this and I have a lot of questions for you. So be ready, okay? I'm excited. We're gonna go through them. I wanna jump straight into it. And I wanna ask you the first question because I know you used to be a pro gamer in your past <laughs> life. <laughs> And, and, you know, as parents, parents always see their kids, um, or parents often see their kids playing games. So how did you go from big, going to be a pro gamer to the person you are now? Did it help you at all? Yeah, so, so the context behind this, when I was 13, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said I wanted to be a professional Call of Duty player. I was playing a ridiculous amount of Call of Duty 4, specifically at the time and just became completely obsessed with it. Um, I think the same thing that you see happening with kids today, how they end up getting obsessed with Roblox or Minecraft, whatever I did, that certainly happened to me with Call of Duty. Um, however, so my parents weren't too happy and when I told them, look, like in 2025, um, pro gamers are gonna be paid as much as Messi or Ronaldo, they were like, you're crazy. Even though that is somewhat starting to become the case, the real value that um, that gaming actually gave me was a different way of learning. Um, because at school, when I wanted to get better at math, or if I wanted to get better at a specific subject, I'd have a tutor or teacher to go and ask. But now with gaming, I was the only one in my grade that was playing um, and never had any gaming tutors, obviously. And so the only way I was able to get better was by Googling and YouTubing. So I would YouTube how to play Call of Duty, how to do this, how to do that. And in the process of doing that, I was exposed to two things when it came to learning. One was how to use the internet to learn new things and how to navigate a lot of information to find good, reliable content in order to improve at something. Because that same skill of learning how to become better at Call of Duty ended up translating, and we'll chat about this a little during the podcast, to um, math, ended up translating to coding, ended up translating to any arbitrary skill because the fundamental of learning how to learn using online resources is what Call of Duty inspired me to do. Um, that's the first one. The second one is it set a really high bar. It was like, it was just so much fun and it was so engaging. I just wanted to, to learn uh, using, using YouTube, Google, whatever it might be, how to become a better gamer. And it set my standard as well for other subjects. And so when I went to go and find math content or science content, I also started to look like, okay, I want something as engaging and as fun as the gaming content. Hard to find, mm -hmm. but it did end up setting high expectations, which is hopefully starting to translate now to the same level of engagement that we want to give kids here at Strive, that learning should feel like playing a game. Interesting, so you're telling me, you Google searched, how can I kill this guy on Call of Duty faster? <laughs> <laughs> and you managed to do it. And then you're like, wait a minute. Similarly, I can ask, how do I solve this quadratic equation? And you exactly. might have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Interesting. As just for parents, like, um, how can how can they facilitate that more? So it happened naturally for you. I think one is just prompting, right? So just okay. It's a really good question. I think the first one, and like looking back at it, what ended up happening for me is I had a very antagonistic relationship with my parents when it came to gaming. Fair enough, I was certainly playing a lot um, and it was compromising certain other things. And I think that's certainly a very valid concern for parents today. Too much screen time, too much time playing games, not enough time outside, all of this. And it's important to communicate to your kid the importance of that. However, the way in which you do that is really important because you don't want to antagonize um, or punish your kid as much. Or at least that's, that's what I would have hoped my parents would have done more, more for me. Um, because as a result, I just stopped engaging with them. So if they did have a useful piece of advice or if they did want to productively encourage me to do something, I'd kind of shut off. Um, and so I think it comes from a little bit of an understanding that the games that kids are playing are indeed actually valuable. Kids are learning real genuine skills and have the potential to learn real genuine skills from those games, like the ones I just mentioned. So I would encourage parents to like, try and relate to your kid. Try and be able to speak the lingo of, of Roblox, of Minecraft, of Call of Duty. Be like, how many, what kill streaks did you get? What skin do you have? 
And when you're able to engage and get your kid to trust you on that level, I think it would become easier for parents to then encourage their kids to, hey, how about we spend less time on Roblox this week and we can look at playing more next week or whatever it might be. Very interesting. Yep. Okay, so then um, fast forward, you went to university and you started studying engineering. But then from what I know, you stopped going to your engineering classes <laughs> and started a, started a, an ed tech startup in, in undergrad. So what happened there? So I, and as well, the other thing that gaming actually inspired me to do was I was inspired to start learning how to code because of gaming. I wanted to learn how to create my own games and my parents wouldn't let me be a pro gamer. So they were like, okay, um, I would rather, I was like, okay, what could I do if I can't play games professionally? Can I make games professionally? And I was like, oh yeah, pro, like the engineers, software coders, and my parents were like, cool. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna do that. So I went into engineering and really enjoyed it for the first two years. It was really challenging, unique, novel. It pushed me outside my comfort zone. What I ended up finding by the second year, particularly with computer science, was that I would study really hard for tests and exams, get good marks, um, whatever it might be, but the knowledge would come in one ear and out the other. I was just studying or working in order to perform academically. And it was particularly frustrating with computer science because I could see the potential for all of the tools I was learning to build real practical things, things that could really have a positive impact on people's lives. And so it was just it was frustrating that like this potential existed, yet it was being used purely for, for tests that were going in one ear and out the other. So from that, I wanted to, to build something. And I spent, in a similar way in which I went about learning Call of Duty, I went on YouTube and I was like, hey, how do I build apps? Because I knew the basics of Java programming. I didn't know how to translate that into building an Android or an iOS app. And so I went on this like month long progress or process of learning how to, how to build an app. And it was incredibly rewarding. Um, and I ended up learning an incredible amount in that process. What I'll say is that in the process of learning to build my first startup, Kulo, I learned more in the time span of three months, of, like learning how to do apps, learning how to, uh, how to launch something than I did in the past 18 years of my education, the four years of, of university. For a little bit more context, Quillo was a secondhand textbook marketplace. So it let people yeah. um, sell their used textbooks online and then people to buy, um, buy them online and make it more affordable and accessible for students as opposed to doing it through other means. Um, yeah, that's a bit of, an, of, a, of a rant around that. We can dive into more details. We'd be curious to know where, where we should explore further in particular. <laughs> so, so basically what you're saying is you use your Google searching skills to basically Google search your way through software engineering in undergrad, right? So, yeah, this is, this is interesting. When, when COVID came around, I was in fourth year. No, 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 I wasn't in fourth year. Or rather, I, I graduated university when COVID came around and I was still involved with, um, with a lot of tutoring or supporting students that were still going to university at the time. And what was interesting is they all started complaining around, oh, I have to do this remote. I need to do all these remote lectures and I need to be able to study from home. And I started to do that from second year. So I was like, I'm used to this. I've been doing this from second year because when I started the company, I didn't have enough time to attend lectures. I was too busy working on my startup. I was too busy working on this thing that I was incredibly passionate about. Um, and so I started working from home um, and doing remote learning all the way from second year through third year through fourth year and eventually graduated. Uh, and it actually gave me in that process is where I became really passionate or interested about education. Because in the process of doing that, I needed to figure out, okay, how do I pass an engineering degree as well as start and scale a startup I was really passionate about. My parents didn't want me to drop out. I was I was quite bullish about dropping out. My parents were like, no, please continue, which I'm very grateful they, they spoke some sense into me. <laughs> but what that forced me to do was forced me to become incredibly productive in how I studied. All of a sudden, instead of having months to prepare for my exams, I would have a few weeks before them in order to do that because four out of five days of my week um, were spent on my startup. So in one day, I needed to try and cover all of the university content. 
And what I discovered is that there is just an incredible amount of wasted time and effort that goes into studying. Uh, and it's incredibly inefficient. The first thing I did is I just stopped attending lectures because what I realized is that you do not learn by passively listening. You do not learn by sitting in a lecture theater and listening to someone speak content. The only way you end up learning is by actively engaging with the content. It's by doing problems that challenge you and force you to think, by doing things that require you to create. So what I ended up doing for computer science, I focused all of my energy on building the applications of what we were being taught. But in math, science, and other subjects, I'll just kind of skip right to the test. I'll skip to the test and exam. Even if I never understood the questions in the maths paper, I'll just start doing them. And in a very similar methodical approach, I'll Google each question how to do it. And because I was being challenged, I was in a constant state of, of not knowing and actively applying, the learning became 10 times more effective. And it came to this realization that a lot of education today is completely based on passive learning, which doesn't work. It doesn't actually educate or teach, teach kids. Wow, okay, so you managed to take passive education and make it active for yourself. Awesome. So, so Tamir, tell me, um, you're running an ed tech startup now. Quillo is also in the education space. What is it about education that draws you? Why, why Quillo? So the first time around was just because I wanted to build something. I never knew I was passionate around education when I first, okay. first came to it. What ended up becoming apparent as, as I started building Quillo and I saw in myself how much I ended up learning by actively creating something I was passionate about, um, how much more effective my learning became when I recognized certain techniques and strategies, I saw how many shortcomings there were in the modern education system. And I was like, okay, there's a, there's a huge gap here and there's a huge problem that can be solved and I have the knowledge or I believe I have the knowledge to solve this. That's one. The second one and probably more importantly is it's just deeply meaningful in that the only thing we have as humans is our mind. Um, the way we experience life and anything within its contents is through the lens of our mind. So if we are eating food, that's through the perspective of our mind. If we're hearing information on the TV, it's through the perspective of our mind. If we're thinking about what a friend told us or what we want to achieve or be, it all comes from thinking and thoughts. And these are informed by our education. Our thinking is informed by how we learn, is informed by the content that's in our brain. And that defines everything. It defines how happy you are, how sad you are. It is the most important aspect of, of life, in my opinion, um, because everything you end up experiencing happens through that lens. And so education became incredibly important to me because education is then the mechanism or tool in which we're able to change our minds, in which we're able to upgrade ourselves and look at new problems in different ways or different perspectives. And so I want to have that kind of positive impact on myself in the process of, of doing this, as well as on others, and the students that I teach, the, the parents we interact with and, and broader society as we, as we build this company. That's awesome. So forward, let's forward a little bit forward, Tamir. You were in South Africa after university, a middle of COVID, and then somehow you ended up in Singapore as one of the youngest people in the Entrepreneur First program, halfway across the world. How did that happen for you? So if you believe me, I met a guy at a coffee shop and he told me to go to Singapore and I did, because that's kind of the spark note summary of what happened. I, I was at a coffee shop um, in Johannesburg and I saw a guy sitting on his laptop coding. And after 20 minutes of creepily staring at like what he was trying to build, I kept like peeking over his shoulder to be like, because I could also <laughs> see the language. I could see he was building something in, in like um, Angular TypeScript, which is a, a programming language. So I was trying to understand and decipher it. Eventually I stopped, I started feeling creepy. I was like, okay, I'm just going to ask the guy and ask the guy, hey, what are you building? And he told me about the startup that he was building around security and, and an AI system for security. And I found it really interesting. We started chatting and he said, oh yeah, this, this program in, in Singapore called Entrepreneur First that 
and incubates early stage startups and early stage founders. And it just sounded incredible. And I started telling him about my startup journey with Quillo and the other startups I was doing. And consistently the biggest challenge I had when doing the two previous startups I did was not having a co-founder. Um, it was being on my own in the trenches. It, like the startup journey is incredibly lonely and incredibly challenging. It will, it will force everything from you. And there were just many times where I felt I couldn't take a break or I couldn't take my foot off the gas because I was alone. It was just me that was driving the strategic direction and pushing. Sure, I had employees, I had interns, I had people working, but it's different when you're the founder and when you need to push and like the energy comes from you. And that was exhausting. And I, I kept saying, or, or in my mind, I was like the biggest thing, the highest leverage action I could take right now to empower my my entrepreneurial journey would be to find a co-founder. And then magically at this coffee shop, this guy's telling me about this program in Singapore designed to help people find co-founders. I was like, okay, this sounds, mm. sounds a little bit too good to be true. And so I applied, got in, and then in the middle of COVID, October 2020, the program starts and I, I fly from South Africa to Singapore. Don't know anyone in Singapore. I've never been to the place before. And honestly, <laughs> if you asked me to put it on the map at the time I flew there, I wouldn't have been able to. I wouldn't have been able to locate Singapore when I was moving there for the first time. Um, and yeah, I arrived. And here we are two years later, found, found the co-founder of my dreams <laughs> and, and building the company that's, that's incredibly, incredibly inspiring and motivating. That's, that's the journey to Singapore. So, so let's touch it, go a bit deeper there because you went from a, a founder to now co-founder and and here, you know, you're a CTO at Strive. Tell me about what it's like being a CTO. And because, you know, traditionally and historically, C CEO was like the role to be. But nowadays, I mean, after MBA, I look at my class, everyone is a CEO, but everyone's looking for a CTO. People are raising money just to find a CTO. So suddenly CTO is like the hottest thing to be and what everybody's yearning for. And that's what you are right now. So why do you think you've ended up in this spot and how does it feel to be that person? <laughs> so I think, I think it's just come from, or rather to answer the first part, like why was a CEO the sexy title initially? Why was that the thing that everyone look up to or aspired to be previously? And I would say it largely came from what was popular in business at the time. Uh, and you rewind 40 years ago, what was important was like brick and mortar companies. It was traditional heavy operations companies. And the traditional picture we had of a successful entrepreneur was a guy in a suit standing in front of a big um, boardroom with 30 people giving a presentation <laughs> on finances and vision, whatever it might be. That became the popularized idea of, of an entrepreneur. Now, however, you Google entrepreneur, you're going to see Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, um, Jack Dorsey, all of these guys who were CTOs, um, technical founders, because as in Jason Horowitz, um, the VC firm says, software is eating the world. And ideas can be a dime a dozen. So everyone can come up within a business idea. However, the ability to execute and then build that idea is far more real and far more in demand. And that's where the value of CTOs starts coming up more and more. And you see it, you see it in companies, the number one expense that they end up accruing is technical costs. They hire out a big dev house for a million dollars in order to build the product um, because there simply isn't a large enough supply of, of CTOs in the market. And I think it is, it's certainly starting to channel through into the education system with more people taking on computer science, computer science starting to become a part of MBA programs, starting to become a part of non-engineering programs, and slowly but surely as well seeping their way into schools. Because if you want to be able to create things in the modern economy, you need to know how to code, you need to know how to build. So what would you say to a business person that says, oh, I'll just pay any money required to hire a good technical person as my CTO? It's a good question. 
I'd say like money isn't usually the limiting fact. Like if, if you're going to use money as the means, you're going to get people who are driven in the short term by money, which is very effective, right? The whole, whole society um, does that. But in a world within, like, there's a lot of capital, a lot of money, it's just going to be who can pay the CTO more. Um, and that's why you guys all see, like, these crazy um, packages that are going to software engineers, like, fresh out of university in Silicon Valley, Tel Aviv, London, and different tech hubs. Um, it's just because you have a lot of money and um, you're wanting software engineers. And so you compete with one another in order to, to spend that. As a founder now, if you're coming out, you need a lot of capital to do that. So it's hard in regards to getting the capital. And then you're, you're motivating the CTO based on, um, based on something that others can provide. And so my advice would be is find a CTO that's connected to your mission. Um, of course, right? Like you're going to need to find a way to pay well in order to get a good CTO. But what will be more important is finding someone who's mission driven, someone who's not going to be doing this for the money, because then any Tom, Dick or Harry can't just come and poach your CTO. It's about working towards a grander vision that both you um, and your CTO are motivated towards. Mm. So Tumor, I find you to be a fantastic CTO, but I also find you to be phenomenal when it comes to business acumen, leadership skills, strategy, just all the non-CTO insights that may come from you are, are of equal, equal strength. So how is it that you've managed to upskill yourself in these areas, especially without really having had any professional work experience? Yeah, so like coming, coming straight out of university, I started a startup, I've never worked underneath someone or worked for someone else, only ever built. Uh, and so a lot of it has been learning on the job. But again, it kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier with Call of Duty is that I YouTubed it and Googled it and taught myself how to learn it on my own. The most impactful resource was the YC Startup School. I would, when I was building Quillow at first, I would spend half of my day, okay, it's pretty much 150% days. I'd spend 50% of my day coding the app 50% of my day learning how to code the app and the other 50% of the day just consuming content on how to build a startup, how to talk to users, how to think strategically, how to build an MVP, how to hire interns, how to think about fundraising. All of these things would be content I'll just start consuming on the side and then actively start applying as I was launching and building the product. Um, and because I enjoyed it so much and because it was so much fun, it, stopped, it just kind of stuck. Um, but yeah, there is an incredible little amount of online resources. And we live in a world today where you do not need an MBA or a degree or a variety of, of these different accolades in order to actually build something in the real world. You just need an internet connection and motivation. Um, and you can teach yourself pretty much anything. So how to, how to get people to do that? Because, I mean, I find your business insights to be equally good, if not better, than most of my MBA classmates. And we all paid $200,000 for that degree, <laughs> which, which you got for free on YouTube. So why is it that people still choose to pay that? Or, or let me ask you differently. Why is it that people aren't self-serving themselves and knowledge nowadays? So one is to say there certainly is still value to a degree. Um, in that to say what's really important when it comes to having a Stanford MBA or for myself having graduated from like UCT or anyone graduating from a university is that you have a way of distinguishing yourself to anyone else and you end up making it an easier job to differentiate yourself to employees, which is a really important thing. Society isn't yet ready to completely move away from university and it's certainly still really important. However, having said that, answering the question on then why why don't people self-learn? Why, why do people end up either needing very expensive courses to motivate themselves to do it and or just not do it? I think it will come down to a few things. Ultimately, it'll probably come down to having a strong enough why. That if I hear from a lot of people, a lot of my friends, oh, I did a Python course for a little bit. So I started doing it for two hours a week. Mm. And then it kind of like, it kind of faded. Um, 
it was cool and I can't really remember anything I learned. That, that happens to a lot of my like non-technical friends that want to pick up, pick up coding and then coding never really sticks for them because they don't have a strong enough why. They're just learning to code because they think it's the cool thing to do and they think that they're going to have a certain thing that they're able to put on their CV, but that isn't going to motivate you as a human. For me, what drove me when I was building Quillo was there are millions of South African students that are lacking in meaningful education because they cannot afford their textbooks. And I have a platform that can make that more affordable and accessible. My learning how to code and my learning how to be a better business person is going to directly empower and enable those students. Very similar here at Strive as well. The grander mission of we want to make education joyful and meaningful is the push and the motivation to learn any of the things needed in order to, to succeed here. And so my advice to someone who's then wanting to learn something new, let's say coding, let's say startups, whatever it might be, is you need to find a strong enough why and don't lie to yourself. Um, if, if it is something flimsy, you're not going to, to stick with it. If it's something strong, if it's something that speaks to your core desires and motivations as a human, if it's something that you're able to like see an output and an end product in mind, um, then, then the process and the, the friction involved with learning new things becomes surmountable. So Timur, let's ask you this question. What's your why? Why coding for kids now? Um, <laughs> so why coding for kids? When I, when I started Quillo um, and learned all these things and as well then went through YC and Strive, I didn't have any tutors in order to teach me this stuff. I didn't have a well um, laid out and optimized study timetable. Um, I didn't have an, like an AI based adaptive learning system to, to help guide me through all of these different challenges as I was understanding how to build these things. And the reason behind that was that I was, and the reason rather why I didn't need those things in order to get to the point where I am now is that core motivation and drive. And in particular, an innate passion and joy for what I was doing. So at its core, first and foremost, it's just fun. It's just the, the in the process time of building, of learning, of solving these problems is joyful and meaningful. It's about being, I suppose, more attached to the journey um, than the outcome and enjoying that journey and doing things not because they necessarily have an output or an outcome, but more importantly, if you just enjoy the process in of itself, that's what ends up powering, powering that sustainability. But now, Having said that, like what I said previously right now, that all those resources I didn't have, which is what we then give kids when it comes to math or coding education, um, isn't needed. Um, in a world where you're able to empower kids to find their own innate passion, their own innate why for learning something, you automatically unlock education like this. Um, instead of pushing a kid or a student to do something just because they have to get a good mark in a test, just because of these external factors and influences, if you can start making that internal and making them self-driven to do that, it, it, changes, it changes the ball game. For me, it's like if you want to learn how, or rather um, learning and all of the work that we end up doing around improving learning outcomes for students, it's like putting a faster engine and a more powerful engine in a car with square wheels. If you don't solve the problem of square wheels, which is like an innate passion and desire to learn, it doesn't matter what you put in that engine. What matters is, is it going to actually roll down the hill when you put it there? Is it going to like trudge down? And <laughs> so seeing that, and so kind of seeing the gap that exists between what I know education could be because I, I know it could be because it was that that was it for myself. It was it was so meaningful and joyful and rewarding. 
and yet you look at education for many kids um, and it isn't that necessary. It ends up being a lot more test prep. It ends up being things that don't inspire love for learning. And so seeing that delta and that difference and seeing the potential to overcome that, that I'd say is my why for, for coding. Wow, so this, this why and making joyful or making a learning joyful could have been done for any subject. What made you pick coding and math specifically? So coding is a, an, interesting, an interesting one. And I think it's, it's the perfect tool to solve many of the problems that exist in education. The first one is that it is just fun. Exactly as I said, like what's important is inspiring kids to see the joy in learning in of itself. And if you can make the, like, the process of learning fun, the rest will take care of itself. And coding is incredibly fun because you can literally build whatever you want or whatever you can imagine. You want to build a game? Cool. You, you want to build a... Um, robots to clean your house. I mean, we might be living in a simulation, which is coded. Like, so you and I might be some Strive student in five years time that's like, hmm, I wonder what this coder does. So it is incredibly fun and rewarding to build stuff. And so it makes the process of education fun. That's the first one. The next one is that it then has instant feedback loops. So one of the issues with every other subject, the way it's done in pen and paper, for example, with math, is that you would write down your answers to a test or write down your answers to a homework, and you would get your answers a week later from your teacher, you'd maybe mark them, and you can't remember what you learned, you can't remember what you were thinking at the time. The feedback loop was a week for you to have that learning. Whereas with coding, it is instantaneous. You make one change to a number, you add one line of code, and you can instantly see how that affects the output. You can instantly see if you are right or wrong. And that effect is incredibly addictive because it then all of a sudden means you make progress much quicker and you start learning much faster. And that just becomes joyful in of itself. The last reason why coding is a really important ingredient or aspect here is that it is a more accurate representation of how we actually learn. So the model of how we learn is a little bit broken. The current model we think of how people consume information or learn new things is kind of like filling up a glass of water. So you picture a teacher as being a jug full of water with all the information and a student being a glass and the teacher needs to come and pour the water into the, the glass of the student. But that isn't what happens. Exactly as I said previously, we do not learn by passively consuming information. The way we learn is by actively constructing information and by building things. There's a, a theory or a philosophy of pedagogy of learning science that was popularized all the way back in the 1970s. And we're only like <laughs> dealing with this now. But a guy called Simeon Papa, I'm probably butchering his name. But regardless, what he talked about was this model of learning through experience, was this model of learning through creating, taking the models that you have of the world and putting them out there. And in the process of putting out your model of the world, how you think about the world, how things should behave, you see where your assumptions are, you see where you're right and where you're wrong. And that is exactly what coding does. Coding is the process of taking what you Think about a system, like if you want to make a, let's say, let's take an example of how does a ball bounce um, or how does gravity work? If I throw a ball up in the air, if I am able to construct the system that simulates how a ball gets thrown in the air and falls back down, I need to address every single one of my assumptions of physics and math involved in that system. Like how fast does it move when it starts going? How does the speed start changing as it gets higher and higher? And why does it start coming down and go faster and faster and faster? Each one of those requires you to lay out your assumptions bare. And in the process of laying out those assumptions, you see where you don't understand things. You see where things are not clear. And that's why coding is going to become such a powerful tool not only in math education or science education, but any form of education, because it allows you to perfectly illustrate or express your understanding of, of a situation. 
Um, it's quite a technical explanation. The last, like, maybe non-technical explanation I'll give is there's a famous learning technique called the Feynman technique, which says if you really understand something, you should be able to explain it to a five-year-old. And a computer is the silliest five-year-old you have ever spoken to in your entire life. <laughs> like, a five-year-old, you can maybe tell them, like, hey, go get me that ball and put it over here. But a computer, you need to say, okay, take three steps to the right, then go four steps forward. Do a forward flip over the couch so you don't fall. <laughs> Pick up the ball with your right hand. Come back four steps. Like, all of those steps need to be perfectly illustrated. And so in order to do that, you need to fully understand the system um, that you're trying to, to express. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. And then tell me about why mathematics? So... I think the first part is to say coding is just a subset of mathematics um, in that, so by doing coding in a technical sense, we are teaching math because um, right. I think math is just about a way of thinking. It's just a way of seeing patterns and problems and then how do you solve those problems? And then coding is a particular implementation or a way of doing that. But the other reason is that math is one of the most hated subjects in the world. Like you consistently hear this idea of, oh, I'm not a math person. When it is one of the most beautiful and incredible subjects out there. Um, it's, it's the things you're able to create and understand when you see the fundamental building blocks of the world. The, why your heart beats the way it does. Why birds move in the patterns that they do. Why the stars or the planets rotate around the earth the way they do. All of these are down to mathematical concepts. And when you understand it, it is a deeply meaningful and for me, spiritual experience that I would want to, to bring to students. Um, beyond that, um, it's, it's then this idea of like, okay, I'm, I'm not a math person. And so many people that say, I just can't, I can't grapple with this or, or it just isn't for me. Similarly, we're hearing this more and more with, oh, I'm not a coding person. And I just want to stop that in its tracks. I want to stop that right here, right now. If I can have a life's mission, it would be to eliminate the words, I'm not a math person from the human vocabulary. Because I think everyone is. I think mathematics is the simple art of problem solving and pattern recognition, which but like because of millions of years of evolution, every single human with, has that. It's not that you're not a math person, it's that you were sick for two weeks in grade eight and you missed fundamental concepts, which then um, for, forced you to fall behind in your math, your math mm -hmm. content. It's not that you're not a math person, you had a teacher that sucked the joy out of it and made it all about road memorization and test prep instead of the things like how your heart works and how the math that you're learning creates the universe that you see around you. Um, and so there is such an opportunity here in regards to making math joyful and meaningful that, that I want to see, see come, come to fruition. So, so you're telling me in your mission to make education joyful, you decided to play this game at the hardest level and pick the two subjects that are the most hated at the moment. I guess so. And the, <laughs> All right. a, nice, a nice challenge is, is a fun one, but I guess that's also where the, the card of the challenge, the more motivating it is, right? And the more meaningful, I suppose, it is to overcome. So, Timur, you talked about earlier on a lot about self-learning. And at Strive, all of our classes are live. They're one-on-one -on -one with a teacher. So, so tell me, what is your perspective on what's the role of a teacher in education? Mm. Mm. So this is where I think we need to seriously like, rethink fundamentally how education works. Because the model that we have of a teacher right now, based off what we had the same 100 years ago, is that you would have this expert that stands in front of a class and lectures to the students. They have all the information in their brain and they need to, through speaking magical words, is going to move that information from their brain into the student's brain. As we said previously, that isn't actually how it works. You don't learn by consuming information. 
So that model of the teacher being the person responsible for the learning isn't right. It's about the student being responsible for learning. So that's the first thing that we need to start changing is recognizing that learning exists in the hands of the student, not in the teacher. Okay, cool. What does the teacher do? The role of the teacher needs to be about guiding the social process of learning. It's not about being the custodian of information or having all of the knowledge, but it's about motivating the students and creating an environment where students are joyful, where students are inspired, where students are encouraged to move through challenges and problems. That's what a teacher needs to start doing. And we need to start breaking those roles up. We need to start recognizing, okay, like let's have the subject matter experts, the people that understand math coding and the ability to explain them the best, let's have them teach it. Let's have them using YouTube videos and online content in order to get the best people, the best explainers in the world to fulfill the role of explaining concepts. But then let's not move that responsibility onto every teacher. The responsibility of the teacher should then be to empower students to utilize that information that exists online or that exists out there and inspire them to push through the challenges that happen in the day-to-day -day of learning. So it's about breaking up the role of the teacher. The teacher does so many things from the admin involved in the, in the class to the um, marking, to the attendance, to the explaining where I think the teacher's role would be most effective and where we should put all of energy is let's enable the teacher to inspire students. Wow. So what do you think then is the future of education? Where do you think we're going? Broad question. Um, <laughs> to where would I, where would I put? Um, I'd say from topics, so one is that I'm seeing coding becoming a much more important part of the syllabus and curriculum. Um, but what's really important, the real place where education needs to evolve is an understanding of how quickly the world is changing. In a world where all the information you could possibly want is available online, and in a world where the knowledge you obtain today may be outdated in five to year, 10 years time, no individual skill is important. No one skill, even coding um, or math or science or biology or English, none of these are the important skills because any one skill might be replaced by AI, might be disrupted by technology, might evolve and change in five to 10 years time. And so what's important is the flexibility and ability to adapt to changes. What's important is no individual skill, but learning how to learn. And very little of education focuses on that aspect, on, on encouraging students and providing students with a toolkit of understanding learning science, learning how their brain consumes information, learning how they overcome challenges, learning how to overcome the emotional barriers that might come to needing to redefine yourself time after time. To being like, hey, I know I knew I was a coding person, but now maybe coding is, is or this particular language inside coding is obsolete. So now I need to redefine my skill set. That's a very tough emotional thing for anyone to go to. And so all of these things need to be things that education starts looking at and equipping students to deal with better. So in short, learning how to learn is the biggest role that education needs to start fulfilling. Okay. I want to go back to this, this teachers and the role of the teacher in education. At Strive to Mirror, you know, we've, we've found phenomenal teachers from South Africa. And if I think back, one of my favorite teachers in high school is also from South Africa. You yourself are from South Africa. So what is it about South Africa that is so synonymous with phenomenal teaching? It's an interesting question. I also noticed uh, there's a lot of the, the startup scene in South Africa, like some of the more successful startups are also ed tech startups, which is really interesting. And there seems to be a lot of cutting edge stuff 
that is originating from there. And there's always been a bit of a history around education in South Africa. I can think back, I wasn't alive, but the, one of the more famous things was the Soweto uprising back in 1976, where during the apartheid regime, students took to the streets because they didn't want to learn in Afrikaans. You fast forward to the most recent time and you had something like the Fees Must Fall movement or Roads Must Fall, which then ended up inspiring a whole movement of um, decolonizing or taking down colonial statues around the rest of the world. So there were a lot of things that South Africa ended up doing that ended up having these ripple effects in education. Why that is, I don't know. One theory is that one theory at least why I think there's a lot of startups that go into it and why I see a lot of education, like good teachers and good startups coming out of South Africa is because the disparity is so large. You have phenomenal private schools that give world-class education. And then down the road, you have a school that isn't able to, to facilitate that. A school with one teacher to 60 students and two textbooks. And so people are seeing, whoa, there's like a real problem here. And people are exposed to that on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I suppose through that exposure and through people being privileged enough like myself to go through the, a good system and seeing how hard other students have it, I think a desire or a natural urge does come up to want to alleviate it. Um, but why there's always been a history around education in South Africa and why we, we seem to be quite a progressive country, always in education reform, I don't actually know. And it's a, it's a really interesting thing I've observed. Well, I think the world is slowly becoming more and more aware of it also, which is quite exciting. So, so let's, see, let's see where it takes us. All right, so Tamir, well, let's, do, let's wrap this up with, uh, with the fast round. I'm going to ask you a few quick fire questions. You're not allowed to think too much about it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and your answer has to be uh, within 10 seconds. Are you ready for this? 10 seconds. Okay, cool. Let's do it. Okay, ready, go. So first question, how has a failure or a parent's failure set you up for later success? Do you have any favorite failures of yours? Oh, 10 seconds, hey? That's a, it's a, tough, it's a <laughs> tough time mark. I'm struggling to, to choose between. I guess, I don't know if I'd, I'd call it a failure, but like I remember thinking at times I thought my first startup was a failure. I remember sitting at the beginning of like when COVID started and um, it, it, the startup was dependent on students being at university and now COVID happened, students were at university and I just dedicated my whole year to this thing. And just being like, oh my goodness, um, like what, what, what is happening? And I did deal with, with some significant thoughts of, of, of failure. What ended up happening though from that was that it freed up my time enough in order to start looking at, at other opportunities or other places. Um, and if it wasn't perhaps for COVID or if it wasn't perhaps for that perceived failure of mine, um, I wouldn't have looked to a different a door that opened up that eventually ultimately led me here um, because I wouldn't have actually then found out about the Entrepreneur First program. I wouldn't have started another thing that would have um, um, it gotten me into the program. So that's, that's perhaps one example of a kind of failure where, where one door closed but another opened and I was able to grab it. Okay, what is one of the best or most worthwhile investments that you've made? Um, is, this, is this monetary or? Can be anything, investment of time, money, energy, whatever it be. Say one of two things, no, probably actually one. Meditation has been an incredibly powerful investment. Just the time and energy put into a practice of mindfulness has been life-changing uh, and relative to the time I've spent on other things it has had the highest 
highest yield or the highest leverage. Okay. And what is an unusual habit or an absurd thing that you love? <laughs> um, like the getting, getting a haircut and then having the razor, like when they take the razor down the back of your neck, that is um, just it's a, a really nice feeling. It's always my, it's the, the, the thing I'm most excited for when I go to a hairdresser. <laughs> okay. And then, Tamir, what advice would you give to a smart, driven college student about to enter the real world? And what advice should they ignore? I'm struggling to choose a single piece of advice, but maybe in theme of, of everything else that we've spoken about here, it would be, it would be about finding a why finding something that, that drives you innately and then chasing that despite societal pressure. So it might, your wine might be strange. It might not be popular. Your parents might not support it as much. Uh, for example, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're incredibly passionate about dancing or art, uh, but you think, okay, I can't make a career from this or whatever it might be. I, I, I always back the quote, he who has a why can bear almost any how. Mm-hmm. And you have people then that can make incredibly successful businesses off of the back of dancing or art or any arbitrary subject or field that may not be perceived as popular or conducive. So it would be to pursue those and know that there are ways, regardless of what you're passionate about, to make a success of yourself and to turn that into something really substantial. And in fact, you're far more likely to do that for that as opposed to anything else. You're far more likely to to succeed, find joy, um, reach that societal expectation that you might hold to yourself if you pursue something that's deeply meaningful to you as opposed to pursuing something just because others think it's good for you. Okay, then what are bad recommendations that you hear in your profession or in your area of expertise? <laughs> a lot of like, um, I'd say maybe in the programming sphere, um, like things like don't learn JavaScript or um, like there'll, there'll be particular perceptions on languages. Like parents will be like, oh, my kids are learning um, C++, for example. Why is he learning C++? He should be learning A, B, or C. Um, and I think it is the wrong approach to, to thinking about learning how to code. Uh, it's not important which language you start with. It's important that you inspire an interest. And so if your kid is interested in a programming language that only lets them code games, but you think might not, but isn't like, it's not used in data science, so yeah, that's fine. They can learn that stuff later. What's important is getting an initial exposure and a joyful exposure to coding. Okay, and then the last one, Tamir, if you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, essentially you have a way to reach the entire population on Earth and have their attention. What would you put on it? What would, what would it say? Hmm. There are too many things. Um, <laughs> I wish it could be a video that could help, you know, then you have, then okay. you have a little bit more time. Um, <laughs> but then that's kind of cheating, right? Then I could just put a two hour video and say all the things that I want to say. I'd say maybe in keeping in the theme of the podcast, it would be he who has a why can bear anyhow. Mm. I like that. Then Tamir, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to ask one more question. I know I said I'll stop, but um, on this piece of how, tell me more about the why and the how of your journey to YC. So why why were you excited about YC? Uh How did you get into it? What was the draw? What was the what was the process like? Was it worth it? 
So when I was building my first startup, like I said, I'd spend 50% of my time learning how to build a startup. And the course that did that for me was a YouTube series called How to Build a Startup by YC. Um, and I just became obsessed with all of their content and I became aware that, okay, this is like the premier place. This is where the big startups are coming out of, um, Dropbox, Stripe, Airbnb, etc. So I was gaining all of my content and knowledge and understanding from there as well as then seeing what they were, what they were doing. And so I set myself a goal. I was like, I'm going to be a part of YC. Um, when I started Kulo for the first time five years ago, it's like, cool, um, I'm going to do it. Applied the first time, rejected. Applied the second time, rejected. Applied the third time, rejected. Then I started another startup during, during COVID, applied with that one, rejected. Eventually on the, on the fifth go with, with Strive and still potentially one of the, the happiest days of my life, I remember getting a call eventually at the end of the, um, after the whole interview process. And I see it's a, a plus one number, um, a plus one number being from, from the States. And I'm like, okay, this is, I don't know what this is, but look, let's pick it up. And then got the call saying, saying got accepted. And that, yeah, that was a, one of the more, the most meaningful or rewarding experiences I've had. Um, kind of setting and embarking on a five year journey in order to, to achieve something and, and getting it. That was a, a very proud moment. And was it worth it? Was going through the process or applying five times, giving up that equity to YC, was it worth it? Applying the five times, yes. Um, <laughs> the, the process of learning each time and in each application and thinking about, okay, what am I going to do different in this application than the last one? is what eventually taught me what I needed to know in order to be accepted. And now that skill ends up applying broadly to, to everywhere else. So, so the process of failure was incredibly valuable there. And then, yeah, the process of being in, inside of it has been incredible. Most substantially would be the, the network and style of thinking, I would say, in that prior to, to YC, maybe if you asked me, like, what is going to be the scale or impact of this? I would have, I would have said, okay, like let's, let's build something really substantial and cool in Singapore. Um, or like, let's just like a few schools, let's really hit it home with these schools. What YC ends up pushing you doing and as well inspires that belief in yourself, it starts making you think on a much grander scale on a, on a scale of not how does this become a successful startup? Not how does this become a $1 billion startup? How does this become a $10 billion startup? How does this redefine an industry? And that sort of thinking has been very meaningful and effective in, 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 in our journey so far.